executive director and uh, we have everyone here so i would request you to introduce yourself briefly and then we can move to the session yeah sure so i'm i'm vivek jha i'm sorry i was in another call which uh, just took you know while to close so i'm i'm the executive director of the george institute i'm a medical doctor a nephrologist by uh, my training uh, but now you know i do very little clinical work just one clinic a week uh, most of the time working with uh, people like women uh, at the george institute so thank you all of you for uh, agreeing to be part of this webinar i think this this is going to be exciting and we look forward to a very very strong engagement uh are we on do we start anand can you confirm that we are ready to start yes oman uh, we can start yeah. is it live kanan yeah, yeah it's live okay so uh welcome everybody for this george institute webinar series on telehealth uh we are in a situation where the state of healthcare is constantly evolving both from the point of view of our personal experience with healthcare and from news reports that we see almost on a day to day basis we know that healthcare has a broad scope and a very wide range of stakeholders which include government healthcare providers payers pharmaceutical companies patients and and laboratories as well but the most important is is the patient really uh, because uh, uh, the, their experience is what will shape the way we deliver healthcare patients and patients and what it needs to do is to provide an intuitive tech experience uh, provide trust provide relationship and provide satisfaction but then there are a number of uh, challenges which uh, all of us uh, have realized from our points of view from the technology point of view we talk about interoperability uh, service design etc but as the telehealth evolves it will go into a number of other different domains which uh, which users will shape right uh, it will be a telecare telemonitoring and expectations will increase uh, which will be uh, in the form of availability efficiency uh, data management uh, and and its ability to provide preventative healthcare as well but most importantly health telehealth should be part of healthcare systems and the variety of solutions that are currently uh, you know uh, um, on in the market and being used by people are all, all cause confusion and uh, uh, hopefully uh, this conversation uh, will uh, provide uh, the perspective of the most important group of stakeholders which is the users it should not be for the technology developers or it should not be for the healthcare providers to tell people that this is what you will have to use but we'll need to hear back from individuals who use them to and and decide and, and and really not only decide but put into action the advice that we get from uh, the users in adapting the healthcare solutions so i see the evolution of telehealth as uh, as as really what it is an evolution and it will go on for some time and uh, it needs to have uh, different kinds of avatars uh, which suit the needs of different population groups in india and i'm really grateful uh, that in in the first very first se- uh, webinar of this series we are uh, going to discuss user experiences and uh, uh, what i'm going to do with with that introduction i'm going to hand over the conduct of this webinar to my colleague dr uman john who is a, a senior research fellow at the george institute and also a professor at the prasanna school of public health at, at the manipal academy of higher education over to you uman thank you professor yeah thank you so much for that overview and i would like to now introduce our um, honored panelists for this afternoon and uh, we have dr k ravindrana who is the chairman of the glengates global hospitals group he is a renowned 
a surgical gastroenterologist and a pioneer and a trend setter in establishing laparoscopic surgery and multi organ transplant in india he is credited for performing the highest number of uh, lung heart and liver transplants thank you sir for being with us we have uh, professor ravi wangdekar who is a professor of surgery at government medical college dule in maharashtra so he is a current president of sark medical association treasurer of the world medical association and past president of indian medical association 2018 he is an exemplary surgeon and an honored teacher he has been credited with a teacher of the decade uh, training surgeons i believe is not that easy sir but you managed to do that excellent and thank you so much for uh, being with us this afternoon we have uh, ms ashna ashish who is a leading patient advocate with survivors against tuberculosis a community group that works with tb survivors and stakeholders to advocate advocate on creating a patient and community force focused paradigm of care that is looking at participatory care and really bringing the voice of patients and their caregivers to the forefront by advocating for their rights and for their ambitions as well as equal stakeholder and ownership within the whole of the care delivery system she is a public health lawyer and is passionate about gender and tb mental health and tb and a patient support for in these areas we have ms atna mittal who is a healthcare entrepreneur who has a passion for improving healthcare through patient and caregiver engagement and she's really used technology as a lever to connect these dots and she's a social entrepreneur and has a social enterprise called patients patient engage uh, and which is basically a healthcare platform that connects people uh, that is patients their caregivers and providers and trying to use uh, technology as a lever to bring um, better care and coordinated care in chronic diseases um, we have dr shanoi robinson who is an intensivist by training a healthcare thought leader has served in csut with many of the leading global um, and local hospital healthcare chains in india he is also the chairperson of the cii technical uh, committee on health and the director of catex health so we are honored to have you with us and i will kick start the conversation by directly going to um asna who's lived and walked this journey as a patient and thank you so much asna for being here and being uh, even open to sharing your experiences so we want to ask from you and understand from you what are some of the challenges for a person with conditions such as tuberculosis or other conditions that would require long term coordinated care across different sets of people and what are the expectations from people with such conditions over to you um thank you so much for having me on the panel um so to begin with um we have to understand um so tb i mean this is for the benefit of the attendees is basically a bacterial airborne infection and um uh it the care for it and the treatment basically is tends to be lengthy so for uh, drug sensitive tb you have um 6 months to 8 months of treatment and for drug resistant tb which is basically a kind of tb where you're not responding to your first line of medication and you need to be put on a longer treatment regimen your treatment goes up to about 2 years uh so through the course of this treatment what needs to be understood is that there are uh certain support needs that the patient basically has throughout uh one is a daily support need in terms of adherence so medication is critical in as in any illness but with tb the challenge is you cannot miss even a single dose it's very critical that the patient continues to take their medication regularly around the same time approximately every day so adherence support is something that patients require uh treatment for tb given its duration and given that you're on hard antibiotics for so long uh patients are faced with many side effects uh so you have some common side effects like nausea probably you know uh difficulty with your appetite um there are mental health issues some caused by the duration of the treatment some caused by the side effect of the medication um 
then you know there's neuropathy so there are all kinds of side effects that require management and that are difficult to deal with without support um, and along with that you have nutrition which is something that needs to be taken care of very critically in tb because it's consumption of muscle and fat as you know um, so nutrition adherence mental health side effect management these are all things throughout the treatment you need support for this so it's not like a one time thing where you go to your doctor for a follow up and you come back and that's about it um in terms of expectations um currently there isn't much comprehensive patient support in a centralized manner i mean it does happen in pockets um but there isn't much patient support in a centralized manner for say mental health or for uh, you know support for caregivers to sort of sensitize them on how to be there for patients how to support patients um adherence we do have mechanisms again um but how much of that is accessible in the private sector we do not know there's some places that are available at other places they might not be uh so patient needs at this point in tb particularly from my experience and from the work we've done with survivors against tb um i can tell you this that patients are looking for comprehensive support for their medication adherence for the management of side effects for their mental health side effects um and critically for access to medication so um because we're a patient collective during this lockdown actually we've received several queries where they're saying medication is not available in the dot center we're being sent to the private sector and these are all critical medications as i said you cannot miss a single dose um so if a patient is forced to sort of engage in out of pocket expenditure not everybody could afford that so in terms of tb services it's not just the support but also access to the treatment access to medication access to nutrition that is critical and that needs to be catered to um throughout the patient's um care cascade thank you ashna we go to dr ravindran uh, so dr ravindran you've been uh, looking at patients or treating patients who have multiple organ uh transplant requirements and this requires interdisciplinary care a complex care continuum and all of this and i'm sure you would have faced immense challenges during this period when healthcare service delivery was kind of shut down how did you really overcome this and did you use any technology at all and um, from your perspectives what would be some of the technological solutions including uh, telehealth support that might be relevant in this context So please unmute. Dr. Ravindranath, you might be muted, so you need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, I think our patients really suffered a lot in this lockdown, and uh, I don't think we ever expected this kind of a lockdown in our lifetime. Uh, I think it's a lot of lessons learned. we were not using too much technology before this covid except doing some clinics where our doctors goes and and they do the screening and then and as a specialist we give a specialist opinion that kind of a simple telemedicine technology we are using but now with this we have to actually engage with the uh an organization at a group level and then started interacting with our patients and doing clinics uh, online clinics and also uh, uh giving them advice information and of course the uh, we just heard uh the lot of problems with the post transplant patient getting drugs or availability and also getting their tests done and all these things first two three months really uh, our patients suffered a lot but in the last one month i think uh, things have improved and uh, i think this has brought uh, a lot of uh, uh, gray areas where how technology could have helped us and i think even now i'm telling you honestly as a user um, we are still yet to crack a, a excellent Uh, modality where we can do a virtual clinics and virtual uh, um, uh, 
has health, um, uh, providing health care. I think that's something very, very, very important. Uh, we're all, we've been talking quite a lot about digital health and telehealth and all those things. We have really uh, cracked it. And I think thanks to COVID, uh, this is definitely now improving in the next 12 to 18 months that we expect COVID is going to be there with us uh, until we have a, either a specific medicine or, or immunization next 12 to 18 months. We are going to face this problem in some way or other, in some magnitude or other. So I think telemedicine or digital health will evolve into a proper model where, in my view, at least chronic diseases management or transplant patient follow-up, many of these things can be done by this rather than patients traveling long distances and also it, it saves the money and also it saves the time and also it's much more efficient to, to talk to the doctor. And the most important thing I, what I observed in this period is COVID because our Mumbai hospital is almost 100 patients, COVID patients. We, we set up a command center within the hospital. It's a, it's a localized kind of uh, telemedicine or a digital health. Our command center, our doctors are not exposed to the, uh, all the sick patients. Otherwise, you know, if the doctor gets infected, we, we lose, we will have problems. We have limited intensive care specialists, infection disease specialists. There are very few numbers. So some of the key people, we, we never allowed them to go and directly get exposed to the patients. We set up a command center. These doctors sit in the command center and do a virtual rounds of the whole 100 patients. And there will be inside doctor, nurse and others. They will, they will support that and actually help us to, in spite of doing all those things, many of our doctors got infected and fortunate touch wood, nobody had any serious problem. All of them recovered. So this necessity is the mother of invention. So we, we, could, we had to do that kind of uh, localized uh, uh, using technology. Uh, um, we had to do the create a command center and virtual virtual rounds. We, we, we could do that, and that is something which I wanted to mention. And but the patients are far outside in the districts and in the, in the different states. We get as a transplant program, we get patients from all over the country, several countries also. So for them, with this lockdown, there is no way we can reach even if they have problems. So we could do whatever we could, but unfortunately, many patients who are on waiting list could not, we, we could not help them beyond the point because there's no expertise to take care of them, though we advise them. Uh, many of them we lost, to be honest. It's very sad. So that's that's why yeah. this telemedicine or digital health needs to work a lot more at the, at the uh, patient level or at the where there are where the patients are. I think that's something which uh, I was reading something you know that in US they created a lot of fever clinics okay and that can be, those can be monitored by the command centers okay the, the main centers. Something like that you know we, we should have a, a, a clinics where there is some basic facilities some of these patients can go and we can advise them so that they won't suffer so much. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I? Uh, sure, Dr. Shanai. So, what, I, what we heard from uh, Ashna, who was a patient advocate, and the response from Dr. Ravindranath, who actually is from the provider side, which means he's a doctor himself, plus he also is a hospital uh, chairman. Both of them are saying the same thing. One, there is a problem with access. So the patients are not able to access doctors and doctors are not able to access patients. That's one major issue that we find. The second thing is follow-ups. Follow-ups is very difficult, especially when there is a physical inability for the patient to reach the hospital. So that's the second part. Third, of course, is adherence. So, you know, you know, adhering or what we call compliance with medical instructions. Uh, that is another big area that both of you talked about. And you also said that probably technology is the answer for that. 
except that we don't know uh, enough about technology and somewhere the patient hasn't been educated the doctors although have become very sensitive to it but they also need education so i think this is a very good place to start from where we say telemedicine is it about just providing consultations is it about following a, a bigger piece which is you know providing ability to comply ability to monitor ability to screen from the same platform on and then there's another big piece that i want uh, dr uman to talk about at some stage which is is healthcare e-commerce which is you know selling meds or selling lab tests online the equivalent of telemedicine so maybe you can talk now with uh, dr vanketkar and uh, dr aparna will probably be uh, Okay, we'll respond to that. Uh, Uman, over to you. Yeah. So, some... Professor Ravi, we wanted to check with you uh, because th there is this notional feeling among many people that doctors are very reluctant to change and they, they, they don't necessarily adopt technology and are adverse to technology. But, sir, you've been in the forefront of this, uh, being in different medical associations, also being an excellent teacher. And uh, so, what do you see? as how is the health professional community particularly the clinicians and the consultants um, are they willing to adopt this and what are the key aspects from a user perspective of doctors or providers of care thank you dr uman uh, first of all let me thank uh, dr jha yourself and dr chenoy for uh, bringing together the users and the providers on the same platform and i am your keen follower of the women on your twitter also and uh, i would like first to respond to what dr um, uh, miss ashna said uh, i have been also part of the various uh, platforms for tuberculosis and though it is heartening to see that various patient forums are being represented i feel their number should increase technology can definitely play a very important role in the follow up or the availability of treatment and monitoring of patients say take example of tuberculosis where as she rightly said all the non covid patients which dr ravindranath also mentioned on a global scale it is expected that 40% of the non covid patients are being the accessibility to treatment is being denied more so for vaccinations coming to your specific question dr uman that uh, the doctors definitely are uh, slaves of routine and whenever we become slaves of routine whenever a change comes it creates lot of turbulence but we are also very adaptable and the whatever time we have got as doctors with the lockdown period most of us doctors have now adopted to the new technological change as rightly said by dr shenoy telehealth is does not mean only giving consultation or treatment it has much more a broader spectrum what we are lacking is the ecosystem for digital health worldwide digital health has got a boost so also in india because of corona the american medical association the british medical association all have now revised their guidelines fortunately medical council of india has come out with certain guidelines but they it is very sorry to say they lack or rather they need to be refined and have to be more practical in nature at the world medical association forum we have two our white papers on telehealth or digital health and now myself is heading that task force and within a month or so with input from all countries we will be coming out with a latest white paper how we can use digital health it will be a great asset if the necessary ecosystem is developed especially to the small and medium sized hospitals to individual clinicians if not for the first consultation but the follow up consultations ecosystems apps have to be developed for monitoring the patients especially for 
non communicable diseases also as rightly mentioned by dr shenoy the misuse of this telehealth platforms especially in the pharmacy industry in the diagnostic industry have to be well regulated otherwise uh, such a good technology such a good platform which is being made available and now is gaining acceptability and thereby its popularity is going to increase we if such fly by night operators come i think then it will have a severe setback thank you so thank you so much so uh, what uh, professor uh, ravi is saying is that it should be an ecosystem and it can't be just um, a cart where we pick up a few medicine uh, pick up a few um, laboratory investigation and have a voucher for a counseling and check out it doesn't happen that way healthcare is complex and the healthcare is in an ecosystem and therefore the digital equivalent of that also needs to be uh, similar reflecting realities and also keeping in consideration the patients as well as the users as in healthcare providers uh, all the other user ecosystem players their expectations no here is somebody who is worked in this ecosystem and build an ecosystem through social entrepreneurship and we have uh, arpana mitalathas who is going to tell us particularly about what the expectations are and how can what are the key elements at now that you think are critical to ensure that telehealth or telemedicine we are using that interchangeably at the moment that it delivers optimal outcomes in a setting where it is all compartmentalized we heard that lab diagnostic chains are on, on its own they have their apps and they are trying to do their tests and then you have the pharmacies who are trying to do e pharmacy and all of that so when it is all so compartmentalized how do you see an ecosystem de developing and what are the critical elements you can share from your experience at patient engage atma thank you thanks thanks suman uh, thank you for having me on this panel um i think i take because we focus largely on chronic disease management i take a different view in a sense uh, i think the telemedicine or even the standard telehealth approach is a very narrow definition as dr shinoy said as well as uh, dr nath said um if we recognize and acknowledge that for chronic diseases most of care uh, including healthcare happens outside the clinical arena then we will start looking at this problem differently we really need to look at how we can address care in place which is the patient's home that should be the first point of you know looking at where care needs to be driven to um, yes it, you also need doctor consultations yes you need medication delivery yes you need all the technology components delivered but you need to find ways to communicate on a sustained basis to the patient and their family at home only then you will get consistent uh, and better health outcomes so if you look at it from that perspective the view of what you want to get out of telehealth changes quite dramatically you are not just looking at you know how do i enable a doctor to talk to a patient you are looking at how is that a small part a significant but small part of the whole continuum of care you're looking at how does a uh, so you know for instance wouldn't a patient and the family benefit from a video consult that shows the patient in his home setting the old home visit system had certain values right you understand the context in which where the patient is you understand who are the caregivers at home you understand where the tv is placed what are the lifestyle habits etc so when you understand all that and that can be for a range of conditions you are able to tailor the messaging and the communication to patients and their families to drive better outcomes right and that's what we've been looking at we believe that informing patients and families about how to look after themselves beyond just the treatment options is an integral part of uh, better health outcomes for chronic diseases so you know in light of that we have i mean we have traditionally taken an approach of uh, 
uh, providing information. But during the COVID uh, last three months, our COVID response has been putting together a series of patient education webinars, which allowed people to address all the challenges they faced, right? So they could come in and talk about, not just talk about, understand what were the options if a medication was not available. Or for instance, when we did the whole series with kidney patients, it's about how do I handle the fact that I can't get to my dialysis as often as I used to? How do I handle refreshing of prescriptions for mental health? The Telemedicine Act just said that you need fresh prescriptions to be able to order through e-pharmacy, but people are not aware of how to get hold of that. You know, they don't even have an old prescription, forget refresh prescription, right? So how do you handle changes in protocols? Now, while the Telemedicine Act told doctors what they needed to do, what it told to some extent hospitals what it needed to do, there was no communication to the patients out there. What is telemedicine? To them, as various people have said, it's like an elephant, right? Some people think it's about getting an online test result uh, through WhatsApp. Some people think that it is being able to order medicines online. Some people think it's an app which allows, which has a chat bot. Um, for others, it's, it's a hospital uh, appointment booking system. So there has been, I think, what we found is that there is no clear understanding of even the basic, the, the latest guidelines that have come out and what it means to uh, a patient and their family. Uh, the other thing was there was no definition of expectations. So is it just a phone call? Is it a video consult? Can, as a patient, can I request for a video consult if I really do want to see the doctor? Um, can, what is required? What do I, how do I prepare myself? When I go to see a doctor, I carry all the reports for the last 20 years if I'm a diabetes patient, right? What do I do now? Do I still you know, have them next to me? Or do I send some of them uh, by whatever means? Do I upload them to a system? Do I WhatsApp them? Uh, so all of those things were things that people are not, there's no guidance given that you need to, before you come in for your consultation with your doctor, you need to have all of this prepared. Um, and after the consultation is over, what is your follow-up action? So there is a little bit that the doctor tells you, but after that, I mean, for instance, you know, you have, you get stuff at a receptionist in certain hospitals that the doctor, the nurse may pass you something. In a diabetes clinic, the uh, dietitian you might get to see the dietitian after you've seen your diabetologist, but none of those things are happening today in the current scenario of telemedicine. So we're just looking at how do I enable the doctor consultation as of now? We are not looking at the holistic picture. And I, and I come back to the point that if you look at uh, chronic disease management especially, and you understand that care happens at home, then you will start to look at what is needed to enable that care to happen at home. How do you treat patients and family caregivers as care partners, not just as care recipients? Because unless they are actively involved in looking after themselves or their family member, you will not get the outcomes you want. And I think it goes back to Ashna's point, right? So how do you ensure that you take care of the mental health issues? How do you take care of the nutritional issues, et cetera? So there is the whole range uh, that you have to consider. And which is why we again come back to the fact that in the absence of a well-defined ecosystem, our view is that we want to empower patients and caregiver information so that they know what to look for. People often don't know you know that there are doctor discovery apps or there are aggregator apps so there are uh, hospital websites that are offering and even i mean i did a random search of 10 websites every website uh, and i did top 10 hospitals in india every website has a different nomenclature for telemedicine some call it e-clinic some call it some ask you to download an app others ask you to um, fill in a form and they will get back to you. Uh, a third one tries to, uh, you know, collects a lot of information before they let you select a doctor. Others ask you to first select a doctor. So there is no consistency across for sure. But even the term, whether you call it e-clinic, whether you call it uh, online consultation, whether you call it video consult, 
all of those are different in across the various platforms. Um, the other thing I think we all know that because we rushed into this in crisis mode, there has been no understanding of the nuances of, you know, that the fact that uh, the protocols, even from a doctor's perspective, in terms of how to handle the communication, what does he need to have before, et cetera, have not been defined. So the feeling is, I mean, there's a relief that, yes, I'm able to connect with the doctor, but there is also uh, a feeling that it's not as good as what it used to be when, you know, I went to meet the doctor and the same doctor, you know, it's so you've, the patient uh, has met a doctor who is considered considerate and would spend time, how are you, et cetera. Now, in the new uh, technology scenario, he doesn't, he's not able to do all that. In fact, you probably need to do more uh, than, you know, less in those cases. So I think that's, uh, we really need to take a step back and look at how we should leverage this opportunity to create, and I prefer the term care, virtual care, rather than telemedicine or tele, uh, uh, you know, telehealth, because I, th I think we do need to look at care as a broader, uh, you know, a broader concept rather than just this narrow uh, teleconsultation and telemedicine concept. So uh, I'll stop for now, uh, and then I'm sure there'll be more thank afterwards. You, uh, so, thank you. And just want to tell the uh, people who are watching this that we are taking um, question and answers. And now I will hand over to Dr. Shenoy to kind of uh, share with us what he's heard and how we could um, look at this whole thing as a completely new paradigm and an opportunity to radically transform how we do care, not just healthcare delivery. Thank you, uh, Dr. Omen. So Dr. Avendanath and Dr. Vankitkar brought in the clinician's aspect, uh, both from a doctor uh, as clinicians who treat patients and also as a hospital chairman who's had, who is providing probably top of the line tertiary care to, you know, to the people in this country and outside the country. So these are the two perspectives that we heard. We also heard one, one perspective from a patient themselves and, and the community that they represent. And then we had uh, Aparna who was talking about the fact that, you know, telemedicine is much bigger. Have you ever thought about what telemedicine is about? And today uh, we are talking about the continuum of care, which is so critical. So let me sum up uh, what I heard from different people and what, what are the gaps that we are trying to, you know, that we have probably identified here. The first thing is that we are talking about non-communicable diseases. Most of the people here are talking about non-communicable diseases. We are having an epidemic of non-communicable diseases, irrespective of what Corona has done. Now, what Corona has done is it has actually crystallized all this and you know, made us accept that, yes, there is a requirement for technology and that probably that acceptance was going to help us to you know, transfer this into non-communicable disease management. That's the first part. Number two, we also understood that 90% of the clinical outcomes that come from non-communicable diseases happen at home. So there is only that much that a doctor can do in the hospital, after which the patient has to engage, as we call it, which is very rightly said by Aparna, that we need to educate the patient on how they need to live out their life. So there is a whole question about lifestyle management, which has to do with behavioral change. That doesn't happen in a doctor's clinic, it will not happen there, it will happen at home. Second thing is to make that behavioral change, we need to educate them. And it's not just one big pamphlet that we give them. It has to be regular in their own language, simple, visual, easy to understand without medical jargon. That's one big thing that we need. The second thing that we heard from Dr. Avindranath and Dr. Ravi is we need to monitor these patients. So there are clinical monitoring that is needed. Uh, whether it's a heart transplant patient, whether it's heart failure, whether it is a tuberculosis patient, there is a constant requirement for their, for their monitoring of their vitals or their health parameters or their histories, etc., etc. Now, that is part of telemedicine. So that's the requirement from the patient's end. The last but not the least was about can we uh, do mass level screening so that you know we are able to go to the communities and pick out... Uh, and pick out uh, patients who are having uh, problems and so that they, we are not only able to identify them early, but treat them early. So the whole concept is about 
what are we doing outside the hospital within the hospital it's all very good but eventually the patient goes home and gets cured or you know gets well there and this is where we said that we would like to have tele telemedicine or you know lots of uh, terminologies around that which could really really help both the doctors and the patients so this is the requirement from both the doctors and and the patients end even if you are doing you know for profit hospitals you still require patients and can you get patients at a cheap you know without having to acquire a major major cost towards them so that is one of the biggest requirement that every doctor or hospital is looking for can i access patients you know without having to you know spend too much on marketing or whatever same times patients are saying can i access the right doctor you know i i am spending so much money on travel trade and all this can i just go directly to a doctor so this is again something that is big gap access itself both parties are, are saying yes we need it now we understand the gaps so what is the biggest gap that we find it's i think in the area of regulation uh, what aparna very clearly stated was uh, i understood that doctors have some kind of a require you know some mci came up with some guidelines dr ravi said the guidelines are not great but at least it's in a way started the process which is excellent however those guidelines cover only doctors they don't cover patients they don't cover technology companies they don't cover aggregators so the only guys who are actually getting some level of let's say compliance or some level of regulation is the poor doctor i mean i'm saying poor doctor not because you know i am a doctor but i empathize with my colleagues because most of them are providing consultations over the telephone or on whatsapp despite telling them they don't do it you're going to be in trouble legally but the guys don't listen to it right why don't they listen to it because there is a huge noise outside created by technology players who have no interest in patient care or in doctors interest but they are the ones who are dominating the no, the space so everybody thinks that these players are actually providing telemedicine but actually it's not true so this is where the space needs to be created a proper regulation where doctors and patients interests are paramount not technology technology is just a small tool for me to you know provide care so next we require regulation which is something that has come up we require education of the masses on how to use technology that's the second thing that came up we need further education about with the professionals the doctors so that you know they are able to utilize this properly which is something that i think uh, george institute is planning to do with this series and i'm very happy to say that dr ravi is also looking at it from the world medical association which is critical so uh, these are the gaps that we identified i think i can yeah. just summarize it in three bullets thank you thank it you is, dr sharma we have a okay. question now from uh, dr professor anushka patel who is a chief scientist at uh, george institute and one of the associate uh, principal directors and she's asking us so the definitely during this pandemic there have been some gains in telehealth that is going to happen but when we move to the new norm how do we keep this sustained so whatever are the gains that the health system is going to get from this uh, hit and try or whatever we want to call it how are we going to sustain it over a period of time and is there any research that is needed to be done to uh, document this because one of the things that we notice across from high income countries as well as low income low and middle income countries is that there have been telemedicine or telehealth pilots but very few of them have been really evaluated against outcomes like all of them have been <coughs> talking about so what research because as a research organization and as key stakeholders uh, around this table what kind of research do we really need to understand this uh, in terms of the benefits and risks um across the spectrum of this telehealth ecosystem and i would request both the um, dr ravindranath as well as uh, professor ravi to respond to this and then we will um, go back to the other panelists dr ravindranath please uh thank you uh, as uh, just now shanoi explained we have a lot of uh, um, lot of ground to cover in educating the patients as well as the doctors and also the technology and you know security of data is another big issue workflow integration uh and and also patients um 
the majority of the patients, I've been interacting with some of them, the majority of the patients feel that nothing like physical consultation doctor. But I think that, that we need to address by, uh, by having a, a proper uh, education, proper uh, systems. The patient needs to be well aware of what we expect of this. That's very, very important. And also, some of the issues we are getting in the, uh, about uh, uh, as a provider, hospital provider, uh, payment or reimbursement uh, from the insurance company or paying, pay, uh, paying uh, patients paying online, all there are a lot of issues on that, okay. Uh, apart from this, also there are lots of new technologies coming up. I think that those will help like you know, wearable devices and all some of many new healthcare technology gadgets are, are, are coming now to monitor some of the parameters, patient parameters. And I think we can integrate that and also use the artificial intelligence. A lot of things can be actually, uh, we can make it a lot more efficient for both patient and doctors and and also data collection also improves and we can do analytics and, and actually provide much efficient and uh, I would say accurate care, uh, near accurate care. That's something which... Thank you, Dr. Ravindu. We actually have uh, kept this as our next topic on the 16th of July, where we are bringing in a few experts with technology as well as with artificial intelligence and because as you notice in the current uh, guidelines as they have come out, that is a no-no on the artificial intelligence and machine learning bit of it. Um, we have a technology focused session, but thank you for your insights on this. Um, we will again uh, try to get back to the core of uh, the user expectations. So like yourself as a chairperson of a large group of hospitals, you have said a few expectations in terms of um, we have all these technologies, but not of the, all of that is fully integrated. And there is a whole requirement around how that can be providing hybrid care and um, trying to give the near real um, patient to doctor interaction or patient to provider interaction as it were. Um, Professor Ravi, going back to you on how do we sustain? We, we are glad to hear that you're working on a white paper and we would hope that our consultations would feed into that. But uh, from your perspective as, who, uh, as somebody who's leading this at the World Medical Association, uh, what kind of research or evidence would be needed from a user's perspective, from like all of us are users in that sense, from the ecosystem perspective that could add value to this whole discussion? Uh, answering to your specific question of your scientists, I think that this is a very good initiative if we can really show tangible research studies of the advantages. Say for example, a very simple example of monitoring the blood pressure at home or the sugar levels at home in diabetics and then connecting it with the healthcare provider or the hospital. And what are the outcomes? A comparative study, I'm just giving a small example, would be a great effort where then if tangible advantages are demonstrated, I think both the patients and the healthcare viewers both tend to accept it much more. This COVID thing, definitely this visual care, as rightly said by Aparna, Home care for Corona is now gaining a lot of importance. All the hospitals, especially all the major hospitals, have come out with packages where digital health is having a major component in treating the home quarantine patients who have been infected in mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic patients. I think this, after in the new norm, uh, home care Follow-up home care and monitoring would play a major role and should play a major role provided, again, I would say the ecosystem is developed holistically. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ravi. Uh, I would now go to uh, Atna and ask her about 
what are some of the best practices because you did mention that we should look at care as a continuum of the process and for somebody with um chronic conditions much of that is going to happen at home so could you please share with us uh, what are some of the best practices that could be adopted and from a user's perspective like i mentioned we are talking about the users expectation users across the ecosystem and atna if you could address this so i think um, we definitely on cannot look at only one mode of uh, uh, care right so we need to for chronic disease management we do need to look at multidisciplinary approach um we need to as i keep saying we need to inform and engage the families because for most chronic conditions uh by definition and by their trajectories it is really about uh you know running in the same place to kind of delay the uh delay the deterioration so it is very important to keep these uh to keep people motivated uh so that they are trying to you know uh, stay on top of their game and and for that i think what we don't do enough of and what we should be doing especially during these times is to look at information and communication how do we create packages of and you know dr shinoy mentioned it as well but we really should be testing this out and saying how do we create these packets of information which we have done in other sectors so we've done it for maternal health we've done it for uh, you know even small uh, pilots for uh, of m health for diabetes in in pockets uh, how do we take that approach to a wider scale and try it for different conditions also i think we should be looking at what it's a good time to start segregating uh different therapy areas so when we talk to skin patients they have been much more uh you know very uh, comfortable with teleconsult because derma is uh much is you know significantly easier to handle especially now with good quality phones etc of course there is still an assumption of uh you know there is a digital divide that we still have to consider uh but if you keep the digital divide aside for now there are certain conditions which are more amenable to more uh usage of uh, technology uh, but there are others where as i think we said before you may want to do the first uh, consultation in person and then the follow ups can happen uh, much more remotely uh, but then you may still want you know instead of 3 month consult to, for the person to come back once a year they do come back right so we will need to create these protocols for different areas it's not a one size fit all it won't be a, a single approach similarly when you look at elder care again we need to look at you know a uh, a multidisciplinary approach so you, because you need to look at uh, the electrolyte levels of the you know the people in for involved so there is pretty much constant testing and monitoring and how does that test how do those test results feed back into the uh, the system and i think somebody has asked this question about electronic health records and that's something that i know you've parked it for next time but it is an integral part unless we get to a state where we are able to as patients we are able to put all this information together in one place and not have it in you know uh, whatsapp jpegs and emails etc we are not going to be able to get a holistic view of the uh, the patient so i think we have to look at we and we definitely need to do a few studies and identify areas which can be addressed more through virtual care uh, and we'll have to figure out what's that hybrid ratio for different conditions right so for instance diabetes monitoring yes if we can afford uh, continuous glucose monitoring for everybody it's hugely beneficial there's already enough studies which indicate that but you know the question also for us is how do we ensure that those who can't uh, afford the um, cgm tools etc how are they going to manage so uh, thank you thank you uh, one minute one minute Uh, thank you aparna for bring that out and like you have rightly pointed out the one size or one particular uh, modality of telehealth or telemedicine or whatever we want to call it does not work we need to kind of define it very specifically to different 
uh, use cases and um, from that perspective um, i would like shanoy to answer this question from vasudra who has asked this uh, what is the need for qualitative research on patient comfort that may be needed needed and i also after shanoy would request uh, uh, ashna to talk to this because there's a whole component of uh, care that happens in the public sector or through public health measures tb being an example so after the, um, uh, i would request to shanoy to talk about the qualitative research and then on to ashna to um speak of the public health aspects of tele delivery of health so two parts here i don't know what uh, exactly the qualitative part is but let me exp uh, explain what i understood from this see if we keep the patient as the focus all our problems get solved so there is two things that i want to bring in here one is something which i call the patient journey so when a patient looks for treatment how do they look for treatment the first thing is okay great so the first thing that we see is then the patient has a problem they actually look for a doctor right they may go to a, their own uh, primary care provider or they look for somebody who's a, who is a, a specialist right so the first thing is they look for a right doctor once they get to the doctor then they look at what are the different treatment options at uh, investigations then the diagnosis then the treatment options then they look for second opinions then they go for whatever surgery treatment is needed then they come back home and they continue to recover right this is and of course in that recovery phase if it's an ncd it's all about monitoring and all i don't want to get into that we already talked about it. so this is a patient journey in any value system whether it is technology based or whether it is you know a hospital or, or you know whatever non technology based we have to provide value to the patient so are we giving value to the patient when he is accessing a patient a doctor are we giving him value or sorry i'm giving them value when they are you know coming in for admission for surgery whether it's to do with compliance with their instructions there are so many times patients come in the morning when they have had their you know morning cup of tea and then their surgery gets trans this is real time every day affair that happens because nobody actually told them that you can't have a cup of tea they just said don't eat anything in morning so don't have breakfast but tea is not breakfast right it's a thing that lot of us face uh, every day when we are having our day care surgeries so can we educate them there when they go home they have 50 questions you know they don't have the capability to ask the doctor or the nurse so they have questions about can i take a walk can i have a bath how do i look after my wound how do i you know what do i eat Uh, how do i take my medications should i take them with hot water cold water so there is a whole continuum of care and requirement that the patient has uh, wants which has been very nicely articulated by both the patient advocacy people and the doctors themselves so that i think is something that technology can seriously create value for the other piece that brought, uh, that i comes to me which uh, aparna very clearly said is uh, about you know the, uh, the the patient itself and then you know looking at different specialties that we call it right so a patient is and as an entity and they may require different specialty doctors to be treating them at one time so if i am a diabetic i may also be taking treatment from a cardiologist and maybe also be taking a treatment from a nephrologist right now if my records are in one place and both of them can actually see what the other person is writing my life will be much easier and probably my clinical outcomes will be much better right so yes there is this whole concept where we are talking about cross referrals and ensuring that you know patients are able to access different doctors uh, again technology is a big big changer there because if your records are up there on the cloud any doctor who's your treating doctor can access them and make the proper clinical decisions so to my mind it's a no brainer simple see the patient's journey add value at every stage number 2 see the patient as a as a as an holistic entity and not as a disease specific person when i talk to doctors surgeons say oh my gosh there is nothing that you know a surgeon can do because i have to see the patient are baba before you reach the patient the patient has to undergo a whole series of pre surgical work and then post surgery he needs to recover all that is possible so then i talked to a cardiologist he says no i want a cardiology specific kind of record no i mean the patient has got to have diabetes also part of that so to my point i'm again i'm repeating i think patient journey and the patient as a holistic uh, view is where we will drive all our value from 
I think that should answer most of the questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shino. Actually, uh, before I jump to Ashna, I want to invite Professor Vivekananda Jha, who is a nephrologist and served as a nephrologist uh, for over 30 years and is the president of the International Society of Nephrology. So I would like him to share a few perspectives about multidisciplinary care for somebody who has multiple conditions or comorbidities. And uh, I will request Dr. Jha to come in. Right, it's multidisciplinary care, multi multi-morbidity care uh, through telemedicine uh, makes it uh, multiply challenging, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, and, and so this is where we need to see how we can uh, uh, introduce telemedicine or whatever telecare that we use as a system level uh, intervention. How do we integrate it in the health system? Uh, you know, the health systems that works. And in to that extent, it will need to be integrated with uh, with the other uh, technological tools that uh, uh, that we use, and and that a patient with uh, these chronic conditions uh, might be uh, needing, for example, diagnostics, um, uh, integration with uh, uh, with their pharmacies, uh, um, integration with with past medical records, integration with, uh, uh, for example, the imaging data that might be available on these individuals. And also uh, ability to uh, integrate uh, advice that one might get from uh, from different specialists because you know for for want of uh, um, uh, you know better or worse in India right now uh, multi mobility care is really provided by patients going to different specialists rather than uh, receiving an integrated care of any sort uh, and that's the ecosystem we live in and so we'll have to make sure that we we adapt uh, uh, the telehealth solution to uh, to that expectation that uh, the user will have. However, going forward, I would like to see that change, uh, and I would like to see that change in a way where uh, care of uh, multiple uh, chronic conditions is integrated in a way uh, where we use uh, technology, but also go uh, a couple of steps further, uh, use uh, the newer tools that we have at our disposal uh, which allow us to uh, to make uh, decisions not necessarily depending on the uh, brain power of a specialist and then going to another second specialist. Rather, we use uh, the uh, the computing power that uh, uh, that you know the modern uh, tools have made available to us, uh, which would uh, uh, interface with uh, with other tools that that were discussed a little bit earlier. For example, sensors, etc. Uh, data coming from there and then going into a sort of algorithm uh, which which could be an artificial intelligence algorithm who knows and and then coming out with advice and, and that advice could be validated against uh, 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 you know guidelines that might have been given or provided by a body of experts uh, or or you know uh, professional societies and so on but that's that's some sometime in the future uh, we also need to make sure uh, that the user uh, user groups understand that that's a valid way of providing care and that it's not just a shortcut uh, in that the care is being shifted from uh, the so-called expert doctors to uh, this tool which is which is impersonal which sounds impersonal and and that uh, it doesn't uh, possess the kind of expertise that that the physicians will have and and but you know putting all of this in place will require uh, uh, several iterations of work uh, which will require a development of these uh, these solutions then testing them using appropriate design so that it all becomes sustainable and uh, for example uh, you know right now the, this telehealth discussion in a way has been forced upon us by the pandemic uh, what we need to do is to make sure that whatever we are doing right now needs to have some sort of sustainability for future and we are hoping that this pandemic will go away someday it will go away right and we'll go back to life as we knew it right six months ago uh, does healthcare also go back to the way it was practiced six months ago uh, hopefully that shouldn't happen and this discussion would have uh, would have really ma made a difference if we can through uh, common consensus not in this one and a half hours uh, you know right now but continuing to engage with each other come up with ways in which we sustain the gains that are made uh, through uh, you know through these uh, solutions that are currently being forced on us and uh, all of you have have pointed out a number of um,
difficulties which are being faced and, uh, and, the, and the potential solutions also have been hinted at. But I think we need to bring all of that together and keep thinking in a way that, that, that provides us with, uh, with more a system level solution that is sustainable, acceptable, and continues to uh, improve as time goes by. Thank you, Professor Jha. Uh, Ashna, over to you on uh, specifically on the public health aspects of telehealth, because you did mention that there are a number of challenges for people who have conditions uh, such as uh, tuberculosis, and I'm sure it's the same for other chronic conditions as well. Okay. So, can you please share your perspectives on how we could, like uh, Professor Jha said and others have been saying, we need an ecosystem approach, and how do we really come together and build this ecosystem approach? Right. Uh, thank you so much. So a small footnote that I would like to make before I start to comment. Um, I've had the privilege of working as a patient advocate for survivors against TB and I'm a public health professional, but I'm also a lawyer by training. So when I looked at these guidelines, my first reaction, both as a lawyer and as a patient was, who framed these? <laughs> and, you know, because it's, it's, we put together, I mean, I completely understand the urgency on the part of the government that now we're going to switch to a telemedicine mode. So we have to sort of get something out there, but it cannot be this inadequate. And the problem with this is this was framed without any community participation I, I, and without any user experience being accounted for, as Aparna very rightly pointed out, and I'm going to take off from there. And I'm going to try and give, bring in some clarity as a lawyer to this. Um, if you look at the guidelines, it defines telehealth. And that's the only mention of telehealth there. After that, it's just specifically a telemedicine guideline. But if you look at the definition, let's understand telehealth as a universe. So we're looking at health services that include medical care, which would specifically be through a telemedicine format. There would be provider education. There would be patient education. There would be no general health education or public health information. And there'd be health-related services. So given that there's all of this, what we have done currently is just taken telemedicine, which is one planet in this universe, and we have left out all the others. Now, the implication of this is when you look at the public health ecosystem, and this is where my issue comes in, that in theory, it is great. I mean, as a lawyer, I can say, yes, you have your basis covered, you have a protocol, you're asking patients for consent, um, but who are we doing this for? Because even if you look at a common consent form today, in my experience as a patient, um, I think a couple of doctors might have taken the time to explain it to me. Everybody else just says, yeah, sign teacher. So in some ways, this has become, these are the legal regulations we need to comply with to, you know, make sure that we are protected. But is the patient protected? Is that consent informed? So if you're looking at telehealth that broadly, then when you're coming up with a kind of guideline that is going to cater to um, patients and users, not just patients, doctors, you also have to look at the players in the system. Now, in this ecosystem, you don't just have doctors and patients. You have community organizations. You have patient collectives. Uh, you have the government. Uh, you have caregivers. And any guideline to be comprehensive enough and to provide sustainable care has to look at all of these. And more importantly, has to have different thresholds of compliance for each of these. So I will take our example with a community organization, with a patient collective, Survivors Against TB. And what happens to us is that we are inundated with queries by patients. These patients come to us in desperation. Now you have to understand where they're coming from. They're not coming to us because they can access the best healthcare. If, if their doctor was giving them the answers they needed, they wouldn't be turning to us. Um, if, the doctor, if they had a doctor available in their vicinity, they wouldn't be turning to us. And this is not to say that this is on the doctors per se. This is a health systems problem that the doctor to patient ratio is skewed in this country and we do not have enough um, you know, resources to provide for our patients. But when these patients approach us now, because of the way these guidelines are framed, where everything now comes under the same compliance level, we will have to go through a three-level step with them, where we will give them a waiver, we will give them a consent message, we will give them a privacy policy. Now, as a lawyer, I can tell you that I refuse to read privacy policies when I, like, I agree, because the way it's written is not in a way that's accessible to any patient. I'm not, not talking about language literacy here. I'm talking about legal literacy. It's written in a dense manner. Even if you look at waivers, um, lawyers can understand it. The people who framed it can understand it. A lay person just signs it or just uh, clicks on, I, I agree now. So when you're looking at that and these patients come to us and now we tell them this, we work on the basis of a 
trusting relationship and a rapport. If you inundate them with these many documents, they're going to fall by the wayside. They're going to stop approaching you. They're probably going to resort to, I don't know, home med like medicating at home or going to people who are not licensed practitioners. So we have to account for the ethical conundrum of if we are to he here to help and provide care, undoubtedly it's important to protect a patient's rights, but are we really accounting for the patient perspective here? So looking at the different players in the ecosystem, even for doctors, right? So a doctor in a hospital setting where they're providing treatment, yes, it makes sense to have a high level of compliance there. But let's say a doctor associated with a patient collective who's providing general medical information, which can be available anywhere. It's, it's basically available on the WHO website, the RNTCB website. to the same level of compliance, it's a problem. The other thing is no definition. So if you're looking at a medical query, what is a medical query? Is there a distinction between providing medical information and providing treatment that is very critical? Because again, there are different functions. I might have a doctor tell me, Hanji, TB ke dawa ke side effects hote hain. But according to this guideline, he has to comply with everything in a consultation manner to even tell me that. He can't say that without accounting for everything that's taken care of in the telemedicine guideline. And that makes no sense because his function in both places is different. In one place, he's communicating, he's giving me health education. In the other place, he's providing me treatment, which can also include health education, but is not only limited to that. So that distinction needs to be made very clearly. The other thing that we need to account for is for patients, um, they need to be at this table when we're framing these guidelines, caregivers, patients, doctors, and from across the spectrum. So even like private practitioners who have their own clinics who might not be associated with big hospitals and have the benefits of huge legal teams, even they need, their voice needs to be represented here. And you have to look at digital literacy and legal literacy if you're moving this to a virtual platform. Digital literacy, because the more complicated your platform is, the less likely a patient is to uptake that service and the worse your outcomes are gonna be. And legal literacy, because, and I'm saying this again as a lawyer, um, lawyers write in a particular way, we're trained to write in that particular way. I am guilty of this, it's called legalese, and nobody understands it aside from us. So if the goal really is to get patient consent and to get informed consent being the operative word, just consent is not consent. It has to be informed. The patient should understand what they're consenting to. Just that signature or the tick box is not enough. Everything from your waivers to your consent messages to your privacy policy has to be done in a way where the patient can understand what they are agreeing to. And that has to be that level of compliance should be there for a proper telemedicine consult. Otherwise, you need different thresholds of compliance that account for the functions, that account for the players, that account for the role that any, even a doctor is performing in a particular setting, a community organization is performing. And you need to account for patient experience. Like when you're going, I can tell you this as a TV patient, when I was experiencing mental health side effects, if someone had forced me to sign three waivers, I would have just said, I'm not going to do this. I'm not taking help. So, you have to, of course, balance, I understand, protect patient privacy, confidentiality, patient rights, but then they need to be done from a patient perspective. We lawyers or policymakers cannot sit here, leave them out of the conversation, and then decide what we need, what they need to be protected against. Because that is patronizing, that is condescending, and that is assuming that we know more than them what they need or what doctors need. So that needs to be. Thank you. You brought a very, very uh, important topic to the table, and that is the whole uh, bringing the voice of the real user and of, of, of a patient and their caregiver to the table to discuss not only consent but the whole of uh, the care process. And for for want of anything better, right? Thing that our healthcare delivery system takes it for granted that uh, we providers tend to dictate and uh, kind of say everything and the patient just follows but uh, you've rightly said and pro probably this is uh, something that needs to be done as a subgroup work and we would expect support from survivors against TB for uh, bringing this conversation to the table and thank you for your support I will go back to Dr. Ravindranath again Sir, we talked about patients' rights and uh, protecting the need of patients. What about providers? I'm sure that there is a lot of implications in terms of um, the guidelines, well, not specifically to guidelines, but the whole of the virtual care and um, delivery of care on platforms. Um, I'm sure doctors are also petrified about 
uh, some of these risks involved and how do you see from doctor as a user or a healthcare provider as a user perspective how we can address some of these things and uh, rightfully balance risks versus benefits and reap the benefits for the betterment of delivery through technology. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, um, providers perspective uh, still there is, there is a lot more uh, com comfort need to come into the providers because again security is an issue and uh, workflow integration and legal aspects, legal aspects how they are going to cover the legally and you know and also reimbursement reimbursement. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. So your voice is broken. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's a little better. So basically, uh, the providers is the security of data and workflow integration and reimbursement and legal issues also technology requirement at um, both sides both at the, at the hospital side and, and also at the consumer side that's very very important to integrate all these things because we they're actually facing um, where we have introduced uh, uh, telemedicine in a big way in acute care so stroke patients and heart, um, heart attack patients and trauma patients in our uh, Chennai hospital. We're actually monitoring right from a uh, patient is uh, seen by a uh, family doctor onwards. We have connect with about 10 kilometers radius, all the, all the doctors. And we are actually seeing a huge benefit to the patients. We're able to plan it better and we brought down time catheter to from onset of the disease to catheter time in, in heart attacks we brought down and we have excellent results same thing in stroke um, interventions we could do it much earlier so that patients could in fact recover and become get up and walk a stroke patient so this kind of things again television, and also with new tools, uh, I'm sure with, uh, some of these ultrasound tools and some of the machines uh, with artificial intelligence will definitely help. And we are training some uh, um, technologies to our uh, emergency technicians in some of these procedures. There's a huge benefit there, but again, uh, there's a lot of uh, expenditure on tools and also training. So I think as a provider, we, we are very excited uh, after seeing that you care by this telemedicine services or telehealth services. Um, uh, and also EICU, we, we are now nurturing three ICUs in, in Chennai from our uh, in our Chennai. We are seeing excellent managed even sick COVID patients without our doctors going and doing wrong suddenly and so your voice so is I think some of these things will so we're not able to clear you too well probably there is some so, lag at your end so I'll try to summarize yeah, you can uh, summarize and then there's a yeah. question I would like to what ask. I heard from Dr. Avendanath was that uh, see he's they are using technology big time uh, to uh, ensure that the acute care also is being looked after. So you know, they're looking at myocardial infarction or heart attacks and, and things like that, and ensuring that patients are able to access their hospitals in time and get treated on time. Uh, he's also saying that we also need to, we are very excited about this. Uh, that's the second thing he said. I'm sorry, Dr. Sir, your voice was not very clear. So this is what I gathered. You are very excited about this and they would like to take it forward. Uh, responding to what uh, Ashna said, uh, you know, there needs to be transparency. I think that's the most important thing. A doctor is not an antagonist with a patient. You know, both of us are partners and the only interest is that the patient should get well. Uh, and that should be the only interest that should drive. 
people, there would be 5-10% people who would bring in the commercial aspects also. But primarily, doctors are not really, uh, I don't think most doctors are really interested in, in subverting the patient interest. The problem is, we are not, uh, they are not educated enough to be able to handle some of these requests. They don't know how to do it. Nobody in medical college is teaching us how to handle patient communication, right? And how to answer those questions. Nobody teaches us even today. We keep talking about it, but nobody does it. So I think that's again an area which Aparna very clearly stated and has been doing that in her patients engages. How do we sub supplement what a doctor is not able to provide to the patient in terms of education, answering their questions through technology again? So that's all part of telemedicine. You know, telemedicine is not just, uh, as we said earlier, consulting. If you are able to educate you, able to give you your cues and cue and answer, question and answer, give you answers to your questions, probably it will help a long way. Uh, that is, I think, the very important part of what telemedicine can contribute. Uh, so, uh, Uman, you did talk about uh, community uh, requirement, and I'd like to give an example of how powerful uh, telemedicine could be for communities. You see, uh, one of the biggest problems that we face in communities is that we are not able to identify the uh, people who require treatment. So whether it is a diabetic or whether it's a heart failure patient, whether it's a high-risk pregnancy, uh, whether it is uh, somebody who's having, uh, uh, let's say, a cancer or is precancerous lesion, we just, people don't have access to specialized people and therefore they're neglected eventually they come to a hospital when it is too late. And we keep seeing this uh, every day in our hospitals. Uh, I was talking to a senior government uh, official who said that I, we cannot bring down the maternal mort mortality rate and morbidity rate beyond a certain level because we are not able to focus our care on high-risk pregnancies because we can't really identify them in the population. Now, can you imagine a better use case for uh, telemedicine than this, where you actually at the, at the ASHA level, you actually look at some of the parameters that are required. It's not, it's a no brainer. There are seven conditions probably which identify a high risk pregnancy. It's well documented in obstetrics. You just pick it up from there, put it in data. Somewhere there's a gynecologist obstetrician sitting in a centralized place, picks up all those patients who are high risk pregnancies, hands them over to the chief medical officer of that district and tells them these are the 15 women who require focused care because they have got diabetes or twins or they have hypertension or preeclampsia or whatever. So these are very powerful ways by which telemedicine can actually power community health uh, really, really effectively. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shana. Actually, George Institute has been working in this area of high-risk pregnancy using uh, um, tools, digital tools, allowing uh, pregnant health workers at Rashas to screen for them, uh, for be it high-risk conditions in non-communicable diseases uh, like people who are at risk for cardiovascular events or for high-risk pregnancies and we found that it's useful but again we need large use cases with the evidence that emerges from that uh, um, uh, again uh, for for policy policy interventions you need the evidence in terms of both impact as well as effectiveness as co as well as cost effectiveness i want to just quickly go to two questions from our audience and one is from dr deepak singh who works in a rural area and he's asking us that um, a large part of the population that they serve is illiterate and um, how does telemedicine or telehealth work in that kind of a context? And the other question is uh, from Dr. Jay Ganesh, who is again a very strong telehealth practitioner for the last several years. And he's asking that, um, is it really cost effective? Because there is a lot of cost around technology and securing the technology, hardware, connectivity, and all of that. Uh, whereas uh, in-person care might be much cheaper. So I would put it back to the panel to address these two questions and then we have to close in the next um, six minutes or so. Aparna, 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 Aparna would so, you want okay. to talk about? Sure, sure. So I, I think as someone who's working in the space of information and communication for uh, healthcare, I think it is our responsibility to ensure that the communication is simplified as required to meet the needs of the population. So, you know, we cannot say that uh, the population is illiterate and therefore telemedicine cannot work. 
uh, you know, we, we do it for maternal health, we do it for vaccinations, we've done it for polio. We simplify the messaging such that it reaches the, the population that it needs to reach. So similarly, you know, we need to look at the same thing across NCDs as well as to how do we simplify the message? How do we, and more often than not, uh, I mean, of course there are belief systems as well, but often it's lack of op op options which make people look at uh, alternative medicine or, you know, because it's accessible close by and, you know, they don't have to travel to, uh, hundreds of kilometers away. So I think we need to consider that. Plus we also need to, again, if we were to, if we were able to explain things in, in a manner that they understood. And I think we also, just as uh, Ashna talked about legal literacy and digital literacy, we also need to start including health literacy in our school curriculum. You know, it is like we did for cleaning hands is, important to get rid of infectious diseases. We need to take those kind of messages, uh, you know, at, at all levels. So I think, uh, and this pandemic has reinforced the need for basic simple messages, right? So I, I think it is our responsibility to ensure that the messaging is simple. The other thing I think is uh, to, the, to the point of, is it more expensive? The question is compared to what? So if we're looking at outcome, and the value that uh, that outcome gives, if it keeps a person uh, you know, uh, in fit condition to work, et cetera, then you're looking at a very different paradigm. So the comparison of is it expensive compared to what is always the question. So you need to figure out what are you trying to achieve? You're trying to ensure that people with NCDs can live productive lives as long as possible and have a decent quality of life. So if that means that telemedicine will be a factor, yes, the initial costs will be high, but over time, again, those costs will amortize, right? So we, we saw this when we set up the mobile uh, frameworks, over time, the cost of technology has always uh, come down. So, and the more adoption there is, the more it gets amortized over a larger, uh, larger population. So I think that's, that's my view on this. And I think again, uh, since we are in the wrap up, I think I would like to reiterate again, Ashna made this point is, we know that the health system is stretched. So how do we bring in, not how do we, we really do need to bring in patient advocates uh, into the formulation of policies, into the formulation of guidelines and treat and at, a, at every level, treat patients and their family caregivers as care partners not just, so we actually engage with them and not just treat them as care recipients because their lived experiences uh, are extremely valuable, especially in the context of NCDs and chronic diseases. Thank you, Abarna. Ashna, one, one sentence summary of what mm. is the key takeaway message for all of us from today's conversation? Yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit to Aparna's answer, if that's okay, before I get to the takeaway. Just very we quickly. have two minutes, so yeah. you, you yeah. have one, one sentence to summarize. Sure. Thank you. So in addition to simple messaging, we also need to look at different uh, modes of communication. So if somebody cannot read, for instance, we could always have a film or an audio that communicates the same information that we need to communicate to them. Um, so that's just one addition. Um, the one takeaway I have from this is um, having a participatory model. Firstly, like zooming out and looking at telehealth as a broader universe, addressing each component, um, looking at the purpose and function of each component, involving more participants than just policymakers and lawyers. Doctors need to be at this table. Patients need to be at this table. Caregivers need to be at this table. Community organizations need to be at this table. And then according to the role and function that each provide. I mean, currently, if you look at the guidelines, they burden doctors as well. And it's going to hinder doctors from providing care as opposed as, as Dr. Robinson was saying, you know, that it's not like doctors are antagonists to patients, but the system is structured in such a way right now that um, is we aren't really focusing on the patient per se. So making the patient the center of this, the community is the center of this, a person centered model is something that would be hugely helpful in then understanding how we can contribute yeah, to telling Thank you, Ashna. Um, Dr. Ravindranath, in one sentence, if you could 
summarize your key takeaway for all of us and uh, so we can't hear you so unmute please so we can't hear you Nina. yeah, yeah. Tele, telehealth is uh, here to stay and it will be part, at least in my view over, over the years it will be at least 25-30% of our healthcare delivery will be through telehealth uh, it will decongest the hospitals unnecessarily come and patients coming all over and large outpatient services and all we can decongest that and also it will help the acute care that's something which i'm very excited acute care now the shortage of specialists that can be optimized by by providing e, e, e ICUs and also acute care uh, ambulances provide with all the technology with the command center and that is something which is going to be very very useful in care. And i think that's something which is, is a good take takeaway point from dr shinoy for you i would like to just reiterate two things one i think uh, both the users the, the doctors the providers and the patients require far more education uh, both on how to manage this uh, and i think they need to be educated to be able to make the right choices about which platforms they choose and how do they choose that is very important because some of them are choosing the making wrong choices or not getting access to the right kind of places where they can probably get better value that is one major takeaway. The second thing I think comes out very strongly is the need for regulation. I think uh, there is this whole place is now a big fish market where people are doing all kinds of things under the guise of telemedicine. And frankly speaking, nobody knows you know, what, what is happening. And the accountability. So as a doctor, I'm accountable under the MCI guidelines. As a hospital, I'm accountable under the clinical establishment and a host of other things. But as a technology aggregator, pretending to be a healthcare provider, which uh, entity am I going to be the governor? Where, how will my, uh, you know, how will I be made accountable? So those are, I think, gaps in the service which need to be addressed. I think at policy level, where George and Steve can be very powerful, and all of us can probably get together and see that this. You know, this happens, you know, not just in India but across the world. Thank you, Dr. Shinoy. Aparna, if you could summarize in a sentence. Yeah, I, I think I kind of all have already said that, but I think telemedicine is, I realized recently, is more than 100 years old. Uh, you know, the first uh, heartbeats were transmitted on telephone lines apparently in 1905. And we have, uh, uh, you know, we've come a long way, but on the other hand, I think it's still uh, a promise that is uh, not yet achieved its potential. So I think unless we bring the patient uh, and the family to the center of the journey, we will not find, uh, and we look at the, you know, what makes sense from the care perspective, we will we will go back to business as usual once the pandemic is over. So we really okay. should use this opportunity to, uh, you know, make the leap forward. Professor Jha, any uh, one takeaway that you have for all of us? Sorry. So we can't. One thing I have anything to add to what has already been said. Uh, the only thing I add is that as a research organization, we do hope that we accumulate more evidence on what is it that serves the need of the consumers the best before we throw it out there in, in the market uh, and expect that people will start using it without, uh, without good data to support its use, just like we are doing for uh, new um, investigational agents, new drugs, etc. There should also be evidence to show that this works, uh, this can be accepted by the users, and that uh, uh, this is but I would also, on behalf of the George Institute, like to thank all the uh, panelists for sharing your expertise with us, uh, being with us for an hour and a half. And to all the attendees, uh, I, I hope that you learned something uh, from this that you did not know before. I certainly did. And uh, we hope to continue to uh, keep engaging with all of you in our upcoming webinar series.
thank you so much professor yeah thank you um, to all the panelists and uh, for all of the audience and for your valuable questions many of them have not been answered and like we have been responding we have this is a series and we are going to do uh, one on technology on 16th and one on a comprehensive approach to the regulatory aspects from a health systems perspective on the 30th and look forward to your continued support and but together we will work make this happen and build the evidence that is required to come out with supporting our health systems to do better using technology thank you so much for being with us and do continue the conversation on twitter and social media there are the tags that have been posted here and the conversation doesn't stop here it's only started and let's keep the conversation going and special thanks to dr shanoy for co-hosting and co moderating this and for all the thought process that he put into this thank you thank you each of you for being with us thank you dr ravindranath uh, aparna and anni and prof sajja